Not to will I love For it's not to will I love I'm Lila and I am horizontal in Bali, Indonesia. And I'm Ari. And I'm Jamin. And, and we're, we're horizontal, horizontal with Lila. Hello, horizontal lovers. Horizontal is slow radio. Consensual eavesdropping. Intimate talks about intimate topics recorded while lying down right next to each other, wearing robes. This is episode two of my four episode arc with Ari Cardos Patel and Jamin Patel recorded in February 2020. Ari and Jay are world travelers, longtime digital nomads, co-parents of two young children, and American expats in Bali. Ari is the author of the book Relationship Agreements, Jamin the creator of The Integrated Father. In part one, episode 104, Good Kids Gone Wild, Jay and I told our origin stories, and Ari began hers. Jamin's story involved a strict Indian family, sisters and aunties aplenty, bicultural identity, being a model Hindu and a very, very, very good boy, doing right by his parents, musical theater and people-pleaser recovery, embracing his weird, Adlerian psych, and positive discipline. Aries involved three siblings, constant uprootings, dance, five or six baptisms, being a very, very, very good girl, backpacking across the world, youth hostel life, sex addiction worries, and Christian counseling. One excellent sugar daddy, Seattle, sex positivity, and her longtime open relating partner, Adam. In part two, we pick up with Aries' sexy Seattle life, BDSM as a highway to vulnerability, the art of submission. Aftermath of a fight or regrettable incident, being seen, heard, and loved, reprogramming people's erotic lives, open relating versus open relationships, and how the longtime nomad couple finally settled in Bali. This whole conversation was recorded over the course of approximately five hours. It's divided into four parts. The first two, Episodes 104 and 105 are available in all the podcast places, and the last two, episodes 106 and 107, will be exclusive to patrons of the Horizontal Arts. To listen to the next episode and for access to the full Horizontal, including 106, 107, and all the part twos, going back to the beginning, or in this case, threes and fours, go to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And my first name is spelled L-I-L-A. And you can find me there only by navigating directly to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila because I'm marked as an adult creator and adult creators there are unsearchable. This is my livelihood for the foreseeable future. So to all my current and future patrons, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for my subsistence. Thank you for participating. Thank you for making the world a more intimate place. Now come lie down with us again in Ubud, Bali, Indonesia. You can hear the sounds of the jungle, can't you? So now when I talk with couples, I'm like, what what does marriage mean to you? Because everybody has different yes. definitions. What does it mean to be the breadwinner or the or to take care of the house? Or what is a, what gender roles do you hold? Or what like there are so many different concepts we come pre-programmed with yes. from our parents and all these stories and what to expect. And they're usually vastly different. Yes. And so really breaking it down and saying, okay, well, what actually serves us? And let's focus on that. And what can we figure out later on and what needs to be solved now so that we can have some more harmony and actually have fun and playfulness in our relationship? Because it's been proven that if you stay together for a long time, you're going to have the same fights that come up over and over again. And those couples that can find the humor in it and that can honor the person for just being different are the ones that are going to thrive, that don't don't totally bog down. So you have to recognize which ones are the forever fights 
that are just going to be repeat. Like, oh, yep, that's number 12. Uh, yep, we have the number 12 again. <laughs> Got it. I don't know how this one ends. It the combo meal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was just a really important part for us as we were figuring out our story and open relating. And and that was really important. So now I'm in, I'm in Seattle doing this awesome leadership program with Amazon and loving it and loving my career and thinking this is where I was going to go. And also becoming more open to the idea of an open relationship slowly with time, but not knowing how that would show up in conjunction with like my family back home. I haven't really heard anybody say open relating. Mm -hmm. You don't say open relationships. Mm -hmm. And what what is the difference for you and why are you using that term? Yeah, I think Jamie would be a much better person to explain this one to you, (laughs) which is Mm -hmm. funny. But I... I think that for, especially for Jamin and I, not necessarily for Adam and I, we would have said open relationships and polyamory, but for Jamin and I specifically, we choose open relating because it feels more like there's a dance and a flow and we're constantly checking ourselves to see how, like, what is the right fit for us in this moment, in this stage of our lives, in a stage of our relationship or relationships. And sometimes we're monogamous. And sometimes we're polyamorous. And sometimes we want to, I called it momogamish when I was just having children and breastfeeding. Mm. I didn't want to see anybody mm-hmm. else. So it was very, it was, it's like, how can you be fluid and dance with it? And so I don't like the label polyamory for me personally, because sometimes I'm poly and sometimes I'm not. And sometimes I'm monogamous and sometimes I'm not. And just like, I don't think there's any black and whites in this world. I I don't want to be under one label. So I like the fluidity of saying we do open relating because in my mind, it means that it's more of a dance and we can choose how we openly relate with ourselves, with each other, with the world. And it feels less confined because people do ask this question. They're not like, oh, you're in an open relationship. I'm like, we're open relating and whatever well, serves us. Maybe because it's a verb. Maybe Mm. what you like about it is that it feels active Mm. so that it's continually happening Mm, in the moment and you keep talking and you keep dancing rather than you say, I am in an open relationship and, and this is how it goes. And my, my wife is always number one forever and you will be secondary and like, yeah, right. So, so you talking about dancing, maybe it's, it's just the, the activeness yeah. of it that appeals, you know, I think it's so, those are such fantastic questions. What does monogamy mean to you? What does polyamory mean to you? You know, because I was talking with these, these girls that I met the other night at Cest, and I was saying how how we think we know what cheating is. (laughs) But we don't know what cheating is for somebody else. For some people, I have come to hear the other person watching porn or masturbating is cheating. Now, I would never consider that cheating myself. Mm. And I would be like, go on and do your thing. Unless it's something that is brought to an, an unhealthy degree that feels damaging Mm -hmm. to what is between us, then it would need to be something addressed, right? And it reminds me of this. Did you ever read Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting? No. So I discovered the unbearable lightness of being probably when I was in college. And it's, I think, a, a very common time to appreciate Milan Kundera. But I just still think he's an incredibly, the poetry, the pragmaticness of that poetry is juicy and ex- and accessible. Mm. And one of the parts that I have always remembered, and it's been years since I've read it, in the Book of Laughter and Forgetting is a short lexicon of misunderstood words. Hmm. And he goes into, and he's talking about a couple, and he goes into a few of them. And the one that I remember is parade. And what parade meant to her was fascism Mm. because that is where she grew up. It might have been him, but I'm going to say her Uh, because that is the society she grew up in. Parades were forced. You had to do it. You were marching not of your own volition. It was constricting. It was regimented and it felt oppressive. Mm. 
Mm. And to him, though it might have been her, parades were were joy. We're sitting on the parents' shoulders. We're balloons. We're, mm. you know, unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> and that one word that you could just easily, you know, you use the word you think you know mm-hmm. what it means to the other person. Mm-hmm. And you really might not know. Yeah. Touche. So it seems like a lot of your work is about removing assumptions by making things explicit. Mm, so much. And also uncovering the story. We all mm-hmm. carry stories. Mm-hmm. And I, during my time in Seattle, I also became a certified coach through New Ventures West. And there were two big things that I really still hold on to from that program. And one is that there's everyone's telling a story. The world is made of stories. And so mm-hmm. looking at different angles you're coming from, you can tell the same story but from a different angle and have it have a totally different meaning. And then the other thing is that everyone wants to be seen, heard, and loved. And that's pretty mm. much my foundation for everything I do with my family and my clients and my work. And everyone wants to be seen, heard, and loved. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be seen? Mm. Yeah, I think for me just tuning in for seeing, heard, and loved goes together for me. I think it's giving people the chance to be witnessed. And as a mom, that's like my biggest calling with my children is how can I witness their lives? Mm. Because it's so easy. Like if I, if the kids are in the pool and I'm reading a book, it's like 30 seconds that I get before they want, mom, 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 just yeah. see me do this, right? I heard it the other day. Yeah, it's it's pretty common. Mom, come look, come look. I'm hiding. I'm <laughs> hiding, mom. Come find me. I'm Follow my voice. Yes. <laughs> They always want to be seen. They want to be witnessed. And we all grew up like that. We all wanted this person that we loved so deeply. We felt Mm -hmm. connected to so deeply to see us. We as parents can never witness enough. (laughs) Mm. And it's also exhausting, which leads me to where the kind of work I'm starting to transition to now. Moms are freaking exhausted. Oh, my God. Yeah. Because no one's witnessing them, including themselves. (laughs) So how do we see, hear, and love our children, our partner, our partners, our clients, our world, and especially ourselves. And first we have to see, hear, and love ourselves before we have the capacity to really see, hear, and love the rest of the world and be able to hold it all and be strong enough and really be that witness and be the nurturer or the nourisher. So it's really just fascinating. So for me, I say going back to your question of how am I seen, hmm. what does it mean to me to be, seen. to be seen is to be vulnerable. And the fastest way to vulnerability that I've ever found is through kink and BDSM, mm. <laughs> <laughs> which I obviously don't do with my children, though my right. four-year-old can tie a mean half hitch already. <laughs> it, it's really cool. But yeah, I, I mentioned it's a long story, but I ended up talking with a friend of mine once who was doing a lot of work around trauma and vulnerability and how to how do you really process that and hold it? And she's like, you know, I've been working on this for years, and the best thing I've ever found was through healthy kink. And I'm like, that sounds so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go to my coaching program, and they're like, you need to work on vulnerability. And I'm like, shit. Damn it. This woman, she's like, you are going to, I want you to meet my dom. And so she connects us around the time of this original conversation by email. And he's like, yeah, great. Let's meet and have tea or coffee and we can talk about it. And I am scared shitless of this idea. So I bail. And Mm -hmm. a year later is when the coaching program is like, no, you still need to work on vulnerability. (sighs) And it's so like, oh, man. So I ended up emailing him back. I'm like, hey, remember me. So Sorry. we were supposed to do dinner, and I totally went AWOL on you. So can I um, – do you still want to get the dinner? And he's like, no, I'm really busy. <laughs> Fair. And being the pleaser and the perfect one who gets everything she wants, I'm like, fuck that shit. I'm going to get you to take me to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> So his website's in his signature, bondagelessons.com. And I <laughs> go and I notice that this person, his name is Max, is teaching a 16-hour rope workshop. I know nothing about ropes at this point in time. 16 hours. Where you should be able to learn everything from never having held a rope before to being able to do suspensions. And I was like, mm-hmm. sweet. I will learn how to do ropes. 
to get his attention. Yeah. <laughs> so luckily, at this point, I know somebody who does ropes. I'm like, hey, can I borrow your ropes? And he's like, yeah, go for it. And I get, ask a friend of mine who's a burlesque dancer and also like a badass boss babe. And I'm like, do you want to learn ropes with me? And she's like, oh, yeah, sure. Let's do it. So we end up going together to the 16 hour course. And the day after the course is over, I get an email from Max saying, so about that dinner. <laughs> uh, so I ended up meeting up. In the, wait, it was 16 hours in one day? No, no, no. It was over the course oh. of several days. Okay. What was it called? Oh, I don't remember now. Rope intensive or something. <laughs> he teaches so many classes. <laughs> There's this rock climbing course that they call from beginner to badass. And that's what yes. I was thinking of. <laughs> So there, so we ended up meeting and he's like, why are you here? What do you want? I'm like, I want to ask you some questions because I heard that kink and BDSM is really good for vulnerability, but all of my upbringing tells me that that it's taboo and it's sinful and it's wrong and it's really fucked up. Mm. And so basically what I'm asking for is, can we do one scene so I can prove that this is really fucked up and it's not for me? <laughs> And thus began the most incredible several years of me being in partnership with a pro dom and learning the art of submission and really growing as a human, especially around courage and vulnerability, which, you know, Brene Brown talks about all the time. Yeah. And finding the most beautiful intimacy. And instead of running from the things that were already in me that I was so scared to show, I just embraced them. And I was able to let the trauma free. I was able to let the old stories free. There are healthy outlets to still play out the good girl and the bad boy. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like there's all this room to be playful and to have fun and have connection. And I think a lot of people are so caught up in the we're not supposed to do that. And we're also not supposed to have fun in our culture anymore. <laughs> it's mm. like we're so serious all the time. Some people ask me, like, what is kink? You're going to get hurt. You're going to cry. Is somebody going to hit you a lot? I'm like, it's, <laughs> you know, it's whatever you make it. I met a woman whose kink was pop rocks and having pop, like somebody <laughs> lick her cheek and then put pop rocks on her cheek. And that was her kink because <laughs> it felt funny and it turned her on somehow. And I'm like, that that's a kink. Like, everybody has their own thing. My thing is sensation play. Mm, beautiful. Oh, it's like, give me all the, like, give me the feathers and the ice and the hot wax and the pinwheel and the scratching and the pulling of hair and the yes. twisting and the tossing on the bed and the wrestling and the soothing and the massaging and so good. all of it. <laughs> I run a dating thing for couples where it's called the Great Date Challenge and I take couples and I teach them the art of dating mm. and how to be more connected through dating because dating nowadays is just Netflix and dinner and then go to bed. And that's boring. Yes. And it doesn't lead to connection and certainly won't change the story. <laughs> And one of the dates that they get to go on has a lot to do with sensation play and getting really creative and playful. And mm. like, what is it like to experiment with the things we already have around us instead of going out to buy a flogger, which, <gasps> you know. My favorite sensation play tool is a fork. Yes. It's so good. It's so good and so versatile. <laughs> I know. It can be hot. It can be cold. It can be scratchy. It can be pointy. It can be sharp. Everything. It can be soft. And it can make smooth. noises. It can make noises. <laughs> <laughs> After three years of going deep, deep, deep into submission, I realized that I was really skilled at being a dom also, and that I found joy in leading people on a similar journey to experience their soul and experience their shadows and be okay with all of it and be held in a safe container. One of my clients is a Hollywood celebrity, and at one point he just said, Harry, being with you, working with you is like just being embraced by your kindergarten teacher and being able to tell her everything. <laughs> And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> but it's so much but, more. But you're, you're, you're doing a, a reprogramming, right? So if you have that figure or somebody who feels like that, who's saying, it's okay. You know, it's okay that you want to do that. It's okay that you like that. It's okay that, you know, these are your fantasies. Yep. You're, you're rewiring him. It's, Completely. It's gorgeous. Which turns out he's also a dad. So the generational impact of how he's showing up for his partner, for his child, I mean, it is there and it's huge. And that's one of the reasons why I think Jamie and I are both right now being called to work with parents, because we've come on this huge journey uh, in terms of our careers and then as lovers and in relationship and doing a lot of work here. And now looking at 
wow, how do we influence our children? Yeah. Because we've done all this work. And what if we could save them a lot of time and money and therapy and all the things? What if we just taught them what they really need to know now, which is how to authentically connect with people around them and their own souls and take care of themselves and self-soothe and learn how they are empowered and how they can be seen in a healthy way and how they can look at their own judgments of themselves and their own judgments of what they want and make their own decisions not based on pleasing everyone else, which is phenomenal. And then I, I turn around and I look at all, like, who are we surrounded by and who else is modeling this sort of thing? And I see incredible, strong moms all around me who are doing so much work to give their children these tools and are using positive discipline, who are really like, and other great parenting tools, nurturing heart and Gottman's work and like around emotion coaching. And there's so much there. And what's that? Oh gosh. Okay. So do you know the Gottman Institute? Yes. So the Gottman, but- yeah. So the Gottman Institute is the world's leading researchers on couples. They've been doing this for decades and decades. They have amazing, amazing resources on everything. In fact, one of the best tools I have ever found for resolving conflict is called Aftermath of a Fight or Regrettable Incident by the Gottmans. And it's a terrible name, but it's a really amazing tool. And that uncovers the story behind the incident that happened. Is it succinct? It's succinct. It's five steps. Okay. The first step is saying, you each get a turn. But the first step is saying, like, how do you feel? And it's a list of 52 emotions right there. So you just go down and choose how you Mm -hmm. felt. And you just name them all. And so it's like, okay, well, I have a form. I'm going to follow this. Which is great because we all come to the battlefield with, like, our tools we learned as children from our dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. And some of us had functional families, just not very many. Mm -hmm. So you come come ready to handle conflict one way. Your partner comes handling conflict a different way, and they don't work very well together. So instead, the Gottman's gave you this great 52-word list (laughs) to help you, like, navigate. So you choose all the different emotions you felt from this chosen conflict. And then you get to talk about, like, very objectively, like, as if you were reporting from a store, uh, like a reporter's angle, how did that impact, like, what, not how did it impact you, what happened during that incident? And then we get to think about what actually it reminded you of. Mm, How do you feel right now? Mm -hmm. How do you feel right now? What What happened happened from your your perspective, Mm -hmm. but object, yeah, attempting to be objective about it? Mm -hmm. I think you to tell your story. What did it remind you of? What did it remind you of? What did the feeling that came up inside of you? What did that trigger? In your history mm-hmm. from Which is your life. probably from your childhood right. or early teenage years. It probably had nothing to do with your partner who just fucked up. They didn't even know they fucked up, right? Mm. And you get to hold space for each other. Then you get to, after each step, there's a little step for your partner to do of just saying you hear them or reflecting, reflecting back. back or empathizing and saying, oh, that makes a lot of sense to me that you felt that, right? And so now you've gotten to share your story and empathize. And I'm missing one. You've done emotions. You've said. Objectively what happened. What happened. Yep. And then you get to share your story. Mm-hmm. and you What get, it reminded you of. Yep. And your partner gets to switch and, and also share what they heard. And you get to, and then you get to reflect and empathize. I think it's the fourth one. Mm-hmm. So what did you hear and how did that, like, what can you really connect with from that? Oh, I would also feel angry if the, if I had if my dad had taken my bike away when I was twelve. Yeah, right. And then the fifth step is optional step. If you can get to it, that's great. But if not, just getting to hear each other's stories where you come from oftentimes resolves the conflict. Is enough sometimes, yeah. Because yeah. you've been seen, heard, and loved. Mm. And the fifth step is if you can resolve the conflict, if there's space to make an action plan, then you can go ahead and mm. do that. But it's not about the drive forward. It's about being present with what's there in the story. Yeah. So anyways, that's the Gottmans, and that's Aftermath of a Fight or Regrettable Incident tool. Yes. They also now have transitioned to a lot of work with children because children grew up into adults. And if children learn how to handle their emotions, they're much more capable adults. Oh, my God, yes. And so my they have a great book called Emotion Coaching, but the gist of it is three steps. So let's say that my child falls down. And they scrape their knee. Mm -hmm. My first step is to witness them. Oh my gosh, you fell down and you scraped your knee on the sidewalk. Second step, if they're too young, probably under five or so, to name their own emotions, I would help them by telling them what emotions they're probably feeling. You're probably feeling really sad and really scared and it's really painful. 
And then the third step is to empathize. When I fall down, I also feel really sad and really scared and it hurts so much. And usually by the time I've done all three, the child is done, done crying, done like they've felt seen, heard and loved. They can move on to whatever's next. Mm. And it's like we can just transition because everything that needed to happen has already happened and they feel validated in their experience. And so you take this idea now for parenting, which is powerful. You don't need to say you're you're okay, which they're not okay. And you don't need to say my poor baby because they might not be a poor baby. They just want to mm-hmm. be like witnessed. Mm-hmm. Instead, now you're using the same tool in your relationship. Now you've got your partner who feels like you didn't, you know, you totally forgot that it was their cat's birthday. And they're feeling just devastated. You <laughs> couldn't remember this. <laughs> it's so important to you. And you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot it was your cat's birthday. Can you tell me how you're feeling about this? And just hold space for that. And be like, you know what? If you had forgotten that it was my actual birthday, or if, you know, if I had realized that I would impact you that way, I would also feel really sad. And I would feel kind of rejected and alone. Geez, I can really empathize with that. And all of a sudden, everything just switches because people are like, oh, my partner sees and hears and loves me. It's not actually about the cat or the cat's birthday. or the, It's actually about being seen, heard, and loved as a whole person and being cherished yeah. for who you are. This gives me also inspiration for how I might be able to deal with some of my judges internally mm-hmm. when I'm having an experience. Yeah. For instance, today, I went to a cafe I saw maybe the first man since I've been here that I thought, ooh, ooh, yes, I'm attracted to you. You This redheaded, blue-eyed Australian man. And I noticed that he needed a charger. He was across the way. I offered him my charger. He didn't understand me. My little sign motions, you know, he came over and he was like, oh, I don't need it. And I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure they don't have an adapter. And I put mine away. And then, you know, two minutes later, they're like, oh, no, sorry, we don't have it. You know, and he comes back over. I'm like, oh, ho. And I I give him my charger and he doesn't stay like he doesn't linger to chat. I have to ask him his name. And I had made a promise to myself at Burning Man 2018 at the temple during my Wednesday night meltdown and catharsis that I wasn't going to move towards men who weren't moving towards me. Mm. And so he's sitting over there and then, you know, another woman comes and sits down on the couch and they, they start up this animated conversation. And I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and I, and sitting there, you know, and I'm like, okay, babe. Yeah. I see it. Like, I see you. I understand. (laughs) And I, eventually go and I ask for my charger back and I I before I do it I'm like you're gonna you're gonna do the petty thing and I'm like yeah I am and I'm like <laughs> all right go ahead you know go ahead go ahead and do it you know like I, <laughs> I see that you're doing that yeah. out of feeling rejected and I'm not gonna stop you like you can go ahead and do it and I went and got my charger back and you know he's like oh thanks so much I'm like mm-hmm <laughs> 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 and I went back over to where I was sitting and I just, you know, I was just with it and it mostly, mostly subsided, you know, like the, mm. the, the like monster, mm. you know, started to, to calm down. And I, and I did a little bit of like, you are beautiful. I'm like, it's cause I'm wearing this big white dress and he can't see my figure. I'm like, if he can't, if he doesn't want to talk to you because he can't see your figure, then he's not a man that you want, you know? Mm-hmm. And also, I truly, truly, in my heart, in my deep, deep core, do not want a man who does not want me yeah. deeply yeah. and passionately. That is not my man. And so that is what I said to myself, right? I was like, that's not your man, babe. Mm-hmm. That's not your man. But if I'm thinking about this like seen, heard, and loved thing, right, I can also use my mothering voice, which I am recently in stronger connection with after a DMT trip, although it almost, like the volume was turned down so much to where I I almost could not hear that self-love mothering voice in my depressive episode this mm-hmm. winter. But the volume is, is turning back up again, and I'm I'm feeling her, and I'm hearing her, and I'm grateful. And she can say, Ooh, yeah, I I can see that you're you're feeling rejected and you're feeling jealous. And it's bringing up this um, feeling of I'm not the one who's chosen. I'm the other one 
I'm the not as good. What does she have? Mm. What what's that? Oh, she's wearing short shorts. That must be it. You know, like the this this stuff. You know, of like yeah. oh, lack of worth. Like I'm not not good enough. Not the best. Yeah. And like, oh, I see that that's triggering all that stuff. Oh man, I oh that hurts, babe. Like I'm sorry that that really hurts. I get it. Yeah. And then, you know, just, like, hold myself. Like, I've done a practice of holding my heart or, you know, just, like, curling up in the fetal position, which is where I feel the most safe and comfortable with my my palms, like, curled in mm. so that my fing- the backs of my fingers touch my chest. And, mm. and just, like, yeah, I can use that maybe as a process internally. So I think that's a beautiful gift you've given me. Thank you. Mm, so good. And I was also wondering as I was hearing you speak about that, if the I can't tell if it's what I what I think is the foundation or what I think is the umbrella, but it seems like it the sum total of it or the foundation of it I can't tell is is uh, being understood mm. and feeling mm. understood. Like oh, you get it. I don't know. Because Jamin's made a similar comment before, and that yeah. doesn't resonate with me. No? Because I don't think I need to understand you to witness you. I don't have to understand exactly all the different things that have happened in your life or exactly why you made that decision or that thing happened for me to witness you and have compassion and empathy. And... And we get a little bit, historically, we've gotten a little bit hung up on this because he wants to be understood and be known. And those two sometimes, I'm like, "Mm, I don't need you to understand me, me personally. I need you to see me and hear me and love me still, even when I'm not good enough or even when, you know, whenever I think I'm going to be abandoned or whatever my core wounds may be. For me personally, it's, it's not about being understood It's just being specifically seen, heard, and loved. Are you not understanding them in the moment when you see them? Hmm. I think I've had some situations where I can hold space and see them and hear them and love them where they are without fully understanding. Or maybe understanding often feels like it's convoluted with accepting. And I don't think I have to do either of that. I don't have to fully understand to see what happened for you. Or to be able to hold space for what happened for you. And that's that's a weird, that's one of those like, are you supporting me? Am I supporting you? Like it goes back to like, what does the word support mean to you? What mm-hmm. does the word understand mean to you? Yeah. And for me, like that, that's where I get a little bit hung up. And that could be too much of a like, I've tried to solve this one before and it hasn't solved yet. <laughs> it's interesting because I'm think I'm thinking of that that night. That night at the temple where I'm yeah. like sobbing my heart. And the temple is uh, that year like the the pyramid made of this mm. arched wood, right? It's but it's a little it's a little rough and there's not there's not places to sit really very much inside. And so I'm on the edge of it, you know, so like kind of crouched mm. next to a plank, just like almost like vomiting tears. Just like mm. really like giving it all to the ground. Mm-hmm. And I could feel at one at some point that there was someone close to me. Mm-hmm. And I was in a state that was so strong that I didn't feel that I needed to take care of that person. Mm. Like they, if they want, if they were there, they wanted to be there, you know. And eventually, when the wave came to shore, then I I started to look up and and you know blow my nose. And there was this German woman, and she said, "I know." <laughs> It's hard sometimes. You know, I wept a little more and and then she asked me if I wanted to be hugged and I did. And she just hugged me and she so she just like stayed with me as the sobs kind of turned to cries, kind of turned to whimpers and moans and ragged breathing and and smooth breathing. Mm. She just stayed with me through the whole descent mm. to a smooth breath again. And I felt 
totally understood in mm. that moment. Not like I needed to share the details with her, which were that I had missed my friend's wedding and I had been pining after this man who was completely in love with his girlfriend, like I always do. And, you know, this, watching myself do this pattern and not wanting to do it anymore and riding through the the sandstorm to get to the temple and like, you know, missing being the maid of honor and feeling guilty. Jeez. And I always do the things right and I'm doing things wrong and I'm doing it all wrong. And, you know, I didn't, I felt, I felt seen and understood mm. without the details. And so I think maybe I'm talking maybe what it means to me I'm just testing this out. I haven't mm -hmm. said this before. Uh, maybe what it means to me is understanding at a very core human level, mm -hmm. not at a detailed level, but like I understand what anger is and I mm -hmm. feel you in that. And I understand what grief and despair is and I feel yeah. you in that and I'm with you, you know. Maybe at the um, under, understanding at the emotional or energetic level. Yes. Or spiritual level. Rather than the intellectual yeah. level. Yeah, and I think when I hear the word understand or know, it means cognitive yes. to me. Yes, yes. So if I take it out so of the mental space. So you're using witness. Space, I'm like, no, it's not. I don't have to understand you cognitively. Yeah. And I don't have to know your whole history to know how you got here. Yeah. Because that is what it would take for you to quote unquote know me. Mm. Right. I'm like, no one can know me. <laughs> <laughs> I am unknowable. I am unknowable. I'm infinite. Uh, but I contain it, multitudes. Exactly. <laughs> Don't make me any smaller than I am. I am so massive. <laughs> but if you take it to that level and you're like, they can know me energetically and emotionally and spiritually. Yes. Fuck yes. Like, yeah, that that is so spot on with what I mean when I say I am here to help people feel seen, heard, and loved. And to witness. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what you're saying when you say witness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's inter interesting that Jay wants to be understood potentially in a more cognitive sense. I don't think so. I think you just solved the big mystery. Really? Yeah, like years of mystery. I think you just <laughs> solved it on this podcast. So well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and he being an energetic blueprint of energetic, oh, energetic erotic and blueprint. Erotic blueprints. He's a sensual energetic. So that would have just solved the whole dilemma that that is exactly what he's looking for. That's oh. why that word resonates. That desire is so strong in him because he wants to be known energetically and emotionally and spiritually in a way that I was interpreting as he wants to be known cognitively and historically, right? The masculine and the yeah. feminine going, we're trying our best. <laughs> <laughs> the erotic blueprints, sexual, sensual, energetic. Kinky. Kinky and shapeshifter. Yes. If you don't know Jaya's work, check it out. Yeah. She does amazing things. I had uh, someone who she had just recently trained lady diana on the mm -hmm. on the podcast with her partner and awesome. she told this epic story of the most incredible sexual session she'd ever have mm -hmm. she, she'd ever have no 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 that's not what it is she keeps unfolding for her the most <laughs> incredible sexual session she had ever had which had happened maybe two days prior mm -hmm. and in detail she spoke <laughs> about this and people who listened wrote to me and they were like uh I don't know. I just, uh, uh, <laughs> how's that even like, uh, <laughs> like drooling? Oh, beautiful. Ah, <laughs> yeah. oh, so good, so good. So this is what what led to Ari Cardos' relationship. Yeah, that's coach. where the book came from. The, the relationship book came from, and then I left Amazon just to do coaching full time and travel and have a family. And we've been doing, we've been a full-time traveling family for four years now. And we were on a trip around the world with our three-month-old and year-and-a-half-old. <sighs> and then we traveled for quite a while. And finally, we came to Bali for three weeks of vacation, three weeks stay. And we stayed for five and a half months. Left and traveled again for seven months and decided we just really needed to be back in Bali and specifically in Ubud, which is known as the cultural capital of Bali, of Indonesia. It has, it's known as the medicine. And the healers come here and people come here for healing. And it's been so powerful and very transformational for all of us. And so I think we're here for a little bit. 
Mm-hmm. And Jamin's really stepping into the integrated father role and really helping dads become whole in who they are and through the different masculine archetypes. And I right now I'm being called to work with moms to help them nourish the nurture mm. and go beyond this mom mode that we get locked into. And these are so much the people I work with in couples. Moms. I, I just met these folks, these folks from Australia who are doing a simultaneous men's and women's retreat. And I just imagined you doing a simultaneous mom's and dad's retreat with child care so they wouldn't have to worry mm, about it. Yes, yes. That would be awesome. That <sighs> maybe down the line. I am going to be hosting my first Bali retreat for mamas. It hasn't even been announced yet, so sneak peek. Mm. And I'm intentionally making it without childcare, which feels so crazy to me. But here's the thing. I had my awakening from motherhood. Like motherhood is such a huge fucking transition that no one really prepares you for and our culture doesn't prepare you for or support you through. Mm. It just doesn't. And all of us kind of go through this, that's it, almost all of us, go through this huge transition. We're like, oh my gosh, who are we? And then we're creating this life. And then we take care of this life. We lose touch with who we are and we just give, 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 and we deplete ourselves. And mm-hmm. maybe we squeeze in a shower every couple of days if we're lucky. And so many women experience a loss of identity when they become mothers. And this goes for all caregivers, but I can speak from the voice of being a mom. And I was speaking with one of my coaches and like Bali is known as Mama Bali. She is, she takes care of people. She has this amazing nurturing element to her. Yeah. So much healing. I'm like, I wish I could give this to mothers. And and she was like, so do it. I was like, well, no, they wouldn't be able to come. I can't get 20 moms to fly here and like actually invest in themselves. Yeah. Right. I'm like, who would watch the kids? And she's like, ask them. Ask them what it would take to get them to Bali. And I did all this market research with moms from all over the world who were burnt out, but they were so willing and excited to be on the phone with me for an hour to two hours, just telling their story and talking about what's hard and what's not. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I'm like, so let's say I tell you you're coming to Bali. You have to come to Bali this year. What would it take for you and your family to be here? And everyone's like, I would just well, gosh, I guess I just need to make sure finances were in order and that we had somebody to watch our kid. Okay, could you get the finances? Yeah. Could you get childcare? Yeah. So what would stop you from coming to Bali? And they're like, yeah, nothing about myself. And Mm. that's so much of the story behind why don't you take care of yourself or really nurture and give to yourself. And I'm like, and one of the things I've seen time and time again as a relationship coach is that people just need to be given permission to do the thing they already know inside of them they want to do or that's right for them. It's like teaching people how to follow their intuition and gift themselves what Mm. they know they need. So it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to be your boss. I'm your dom. I'm your mama dom. Yes. (laughs) You're coming to Bali. And the agenda is to take care of yourself and to celebrate you. Because when you are celebrated, when you love on yourself, you're going to go home and you're going to be a better partner. You're going to be a better mama. You're going to be a better community member. And you're going to model what it's like to be healthy for your children and stop yelling at them and stop being off balance and stop wondering why everything is so effing hard all the time because you will have found yourself again and you'll know who you are. Hmm. Mine is giving myself permission to give up these regular yoga classes to untether myself from a location. Mm, That's scary. And maybe even to leave my community, even though it's been (sighs) powerful and transformative and led me to this, Mm. which feels like at least a piece of life's work, really truly purposeful, powerful, satisfying, pleasurable. It feels like icky guy feels like that what the world needs what you're good at what you can make money from you know mm-hmm. it, feel, it feels like the the center of that diagram and it's just like oh well I, oh I can't quite do it yet you know like I'm not making enough from it yet to, to <laughs> leave you know to, to leave. and <laughs> do you mean physically leave both 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 right too in which case, I would invite you to look at the language you're using, the story you're holding on to, right? It's mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. it's like when people tell me, I need to break up with someone. I'm like, 
Do you need to break up with them or do you need to transition to something else? What does the transition look like? What if it wasn't black and white? What if you don't have to leave, but you need to transition to a long distance relationship? Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I have been I have been contemplating. Something I'm I'm very clear on in, in my first week here is I'm if I do stay in New York, I must leave every winter. Mm, every yep. winter. That is that is it. I am done putting my poor highly sensitive person, <laughs> uh, depressive, gened, anxiety-prone body, sweet, wonderful, beautiful, sexy body that it is, through New York the winters. harsh-ass <laughs> winter of New York. <laughs> uh, that is one of the hardest winters, I think, globally. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard. And when I got so depressed in November that I... I Basically, I stopped releasing in mid-December because of it. My friend asked, my best friend, one of my best friends, Margarita, asked, you know, has this has it happened before? Like, has it been this bad before? And I said, yes, maybe two, two maybe three times. She said, how long did it take to come out of it? And I said, well, a few months each time. And she's like, well, you've come out of it before. That was good to remember. And also when I looked at those times... It was always around November. <laughs> it's always right around November. After my my birthday's in October. October feels good. It feels like sweet melancholy. And then like November comes in and I'm like, fuck. Life sucks. I suck. I'm not as good as I want to be. I haven't achieved anything in my life. I've done nothing with my life. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so those voices <laughs> leaving in November. <laughs> I'm very clear that I need to start spending at least half, if not the entire winter away. And it may be more that really stepping into a digital nomad lifestyle is the right thing for me. Mm. I have always had wanderlust. I've always traveled often. And when I don't leave New York regularly, it's it's not healthy, even in non-winter times. Mm -hmm. I've gone well, cross country beautiful. twice. Bali is so beautiful. So you know, it's a good home away from home half a year. Yes, so. yes, exactly. So I do like that thinking of it as it's basically your your positive psychology parenting. What is it? Positive discipline. Positive. Positively disciplining myself, saying, I am going to transition into. <laughs> I can go Rather to than I'm going to break places. up with. Yeah. <laughs> transition to a nice acquaintanceship. <laughs> yes. A pleasant acquaintance. Here are the boundaries I'm going to set for myself. Yep. Oh. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this was lovely. This episode was mixed and mastered by Irving Godori. Irving, my sound engineer extraordinaire, has recorded a Grammy-nominated platinum album. You too can hire him through igrecording.com on the interwebs. The remix of my original music, which you'll hear in its entirety after this outro, was created by the acapella beatbox musician Kid Mental. This means that he is the instrument, and all of the melodies, beats, and harmonies come directly from his lips. You can have a theme song of your very own by commissioning him on Fiverr or becoming his patron on patreon.com slash kidmental. The next two episodes, 106 and 107, encompass the second half of my conversation with Ari and Jay. They will be available exclusively to patrons of the Horizontal Arts. In order to listen to next week's episode and for access to all the part twos going back to the beginning, or in this case, threes and fours, Become my patron by navigating directly to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. I've started writing again, and I'll be hosting some digital connection workshops in the months to come. So to receive my missives with all the horizontal updates, all the horizontality, Sign up on HorizontalWithLila.com. I have a gift for you. I know that many of us don't know how to handle or sometimes even how to identify our big emotions right now. 
during what is variously dubbed the Great Pause, Coronageddon, and World War III. It's very possible that the people you live with are as emotionally taxed as you are. But I might not be. I'm in Bali, I have sun, I have space, and I have some emotional resources to spare. I'd be honored to hold space for you using the Mama Gina technique of spring cleaning. It's one of the most effective emotional release practices I've ever learned. I've demonstrated it on the podcast with Lee Noto in episode 71, The Women of Venus, and also in the last 10 minutes of my recent spring cleaning and emotional release live video show, which you can find on my YouTube channel. As Lee said in the episode, spring cleaning is a place to let everything out. In her words, someone witnesses you in that, and they might come into the conversation and say, welcome to your spring clean. What would you like to spring clean on? And I might say anger or the fact that I just got a parking ticket. You can choose anything. They might say, okay, you have seven pulls or seven rounds to release. And it's basically seven streams of consciousness through this topic, which may or may not stay that topic throughout the entire spring clean. It can evolve. And it's just an emptying, a complete emptying out of the vessel through words. In my experience, this takes about half an hour. If you'd like to take me up on this space-holding offer, especially if it's edgy for you or you think you don't deserve it or you've never done anything like it before, send me an email to lila at horizontalwithlila.com. Micah Busey of Judson Church in Manhattan has been sharing these tiny prayers on Facebook every day. This is the one from Wednesday. For those who are feeling stagnant, may you remember that your body and life are not mere tools for productivity, no matter what capitalism tells you, but rather dynamic, breathing realities that need rest, quiet, time, and space, and will organically tell you when they are ready to do and not just be again. Thank you for lying down with us. Thank you for getting horizontal. From the bed turn a spark to a fire. Horizontal with Lila. Horizontal with Lila. Is an intimate expression No matter how received You still can't change the message A length without measure A priceless affection The timeless connection of electric The feeling that we define as a pleasure Between you and I A friendship's warm embrace Like a fire The cherished moments shared like stars in the sky As the sun sets horizontal with Lila From the bed turn a spark to a fire Horizontal with Lila So I'm so excited for part two. Yeah, I have many agreementy and parenty questions for you and great we have an amazing birth story to tell if you oh birth sto- uh, or conception story and birth story yes definitely so tomorrow we'll talk more about the the duo of you and then the quartet 